Well, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome. My name's Jonathan Warren. I'm the chief executive of the car list of the place focused think tank. And a very warm welcome to the third and final of our series of webinars based around procurement reform, levelling up procurement using government spend to transform local economic outcomes. As ever, a huge thanks to our partners in this Social Value UK, Catherine Maddy, and all their help behind the scenes in promoting this getting today's um, agenda together. So our event today, Leveling Up Procurement, we've brought together, as with previous events, a top panel of experts to really know that the purpose of this, the intention is to open up a genuine debate to consider how we might arrive at a definition of the good and the useful in the context of the Green Paper for Transforming Public Procurement, um, which is avowedly set out to promote value and transparency at the expense of um, red tape. Also, thanks to our Workstream Research Partners, Mears Group, um, on whose behalf the Carlis is conducting a piece of research called True Value Towards Ethical Public Service Commissioning. So, on with the show. Now, as a principle of public procurement, value for money, the public good, integrity, efficiency, fair treatment of suppliers, non-discrimination and transparency are soon to be enshrined in law. So far, so good. Now, today's agenda is the economic uplift, levelling up. It's a phrase we can't escape, so we'll stick with it. And there's been a lot said about levelling up as a, as a political policy phrase since the 2019 Brexit election. More recently, if you cast our minds back to the middle of July, in Boris Johnson's set piece speech on the subject, he painted, I think, a very broad canvas, everything from crime to educational attainment to public health inequality. But I think in fairness, speak, there, there wasn't probably enough ballast on kind of the, the productivity gap and the long-term strategic steps to uh, resolving productivity and rebalancing the economy. Um, more of that anon. Um, now there's, an, there's an interesting poll out this week from YouGov, and they found that levelling up with the public is a popular idea of the abstract. It cuts through at all levels, um, and two thirds of people in England say it should be a high or medium priority of government. Um, but there is, however, you may be surprised, a kind of widespread sense of scepticism about what levelling up will achieve in practice. There's also, from a place perspective, a clear regional variation in attitudes towards levelling up, with those in the North and the Midlands noticeably more likely to feel enthusiastic about the programme than those living in London and the South East. So, with all the hullabaloo, the hot fuss of yesterday's reshuffle, with Michael Gove switching from the Cabinet's office where he was overseeing this programme um, of procurement reform to head up levelling up as the new local government secretary with Kemi Badendock as the minister responsible for levelling up. Um, I think this is good news for, the, for kind of the, this agenda in terms of regional rebalancing. It's going to gain traction in, in the same way as the people were saying yesterday, in the way the ghost have brought energy, heft and intellectual vigour to previous assignments, whether they're a DEFRA or justice. So it you know, spells good for it. Um, but for the purpose of today's discussion, we're solely focused on the role of annual procurement spend of roughly 300 billion, how we can use that to drive economic renewal and social gain at the level of place. And so we want to focus on today's discussion with our panel of experts on some important policy strands. First up, how would it be possible and what would be necessary to make the reform of public service commissioning align with the government's broader overarching strategy to level up opportunities, particularly in all important left behind places. Secondly, given the need to squeeze the most out of the local pound and, and the public purse over the next spending review uh, period and drive that post pandemic recovery, is there any way we can perhaps challenge government supplies? For example, is every single last penny of local procurement promoting things like a living wage to get people out of poverty? Um, also asked on the, on the supply side, are our major providers of local services, are they 
benefiting from procurement helping people and for example how many apprenticeships are being delivered every one million pounds spent on local schemes and beyond that now how do we measure this what what should the metrics be when looking at things like the impact on skills reskilling jobs and business growth from direct changes to procurement practice so that's kind of the ambit that's kind of some of the some of the issues i'll be asking my panel to speak of um very soon so again we'll be sketching the debate off very soon uh let me introduce our expert panel for whom we're all like, grateful to, to making their, their time available this morning first up we've got darren Nald, chief procurement officer at durham county council and chair of the national advisory group for the local government association great to have a local government practitioner darren thank you also a great pleasure to have the wonderful jeffrey matsu chief economist for sitfa after um in, in, terms of, in terms of speaker order next we're going to have after jeffrey chris white professor chris white in his new role as director of industrial policy and insight center at mtc and visiting professor of industrial strategy at Loughborough University and as ever a huge debt of gratitude for Chris for the social value act in the first instance and to round off our speakers um great pleasure to hear from Isabel Passaram Passaram the chief executive of our, our partners in this event social value UK so essentially that, that's kind of the rules today we're going to have four panelists each in order then we'll be putting in into the Q&A box to get questions from the audience and have an exchange of dialogue between the panel. As with all our events, we will finish at exactly 12 o'clock, um, just, like, well, just like Cinderella, but at noon. Um, we're also covering today's event on Twitter for any social medias out there, and the hashtag is LU Procurement. And um, that's also in the chat box for us. So without any further ado, I'm gonna open up the floor to Darren Nald from Durham County Council to begin today's policy debate. Darren, it is over to you, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Delighted to, to, to be here. Um, I think I've got one slide, if we could just put, put that up. Um, just as background, I'm um, responsible for procurement at Durham, um, as Jonathan explained, but also I'm chair of the National Advisory Group for Procurement for uh, the LGA but also I'm chair of the National Social Value Task Force uh, and, and, and the LJ chair. And essentially I'm a, I'm a procurement practitioner um, in simple parlance. I think if we reflect on, on several of the topics really that have been raised, obviously there's a lot of policy changes and from, from my perspective for the good, um, you know, since the Public Services Social Value Act, um, social value has, has gathered pace and government really are, pushing hard on that with the, uh, with the green paper that we should get a response from um, around about October time, I, I believe. And then we've got the, the, the new rules and regulations that, as I understand it, um, will probably go through Parliament um, around about spring 22. So we should see the new rules in, in 23. And you can see on the slide there, what, it, what does that actually mean? Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of the details, but clearly we've got a, um, evidence that we're, we're meeting government's uh, key priorities regarding new business, new jobs and new skills, supplier diversity, innovation and resilience, as well as inevitably tackling uh, climate change and reducing waste. And if you look through the policy and the green paper, social value, very much social, economic and environmental outcomes is at, is at the heart of it. So what does that actually mean? And you know, what's next? For, for us practitioners to, to take advantage of this, um, you know, these exciting opportunities. I think, you know, regarding levelling up, um, obviously uh, increased spending is, is, is most welcome, but I think we need a fairer and a more sustainable funding streams um, to get the maximum out of the, you know, every pound that we spend, we need to plan, we need to gauge in the market really, um, really early and really carefully. Um, so longer visibility of funded streams is equally as important as an increase in, in, in funded streams to enable us to tackle the, the obvious inequalities. And really, as a procurement practitioner, um, you know, if I go back uh, a few years, it was very much because of austerity about saving money. But I think the last couple of years, very much 
social value of being at the fore. It's about adding value and showing how your procurement spend can achieve your, uh, your, your organization's objectives and do good things in uh, communities. And very much um, we're now following, I, I would say, a place-based approach to social value. So we've started an initiative in Durham called the County Durham Pound, where we're collaborating with police and fire and health um, and housing and university and prisons and Northumbria Water to work together to train and educate ourselves to understand each other's objectives, how we can work together, but also deliver social value outcomes. I think it's important also to measure those outcomes. Um, you know, since Chris's great early work uh, on, the, on the Social Value Act, we launched uh, a technical tool called Themes, Outcomes and Measures from the, uh, the, the task force, which was developed by Social Value Portal for us. But that's given us a lot of measures and uh, things that we can tangibly quantify. Now, that is really helpful because if you can describe social value and you can measure social value, you can include it in your decision making. And you'll see, you know, government now have a minimum of 10 percent in their contracts. And if you look at local authorities, councils, you know, it's not uncommon to see 20 percent social value weighting in things and doing good is, is, is you know, is good business. But I think one of the lessons learned the last couple of years is the importance of not just social value, but the right social value at the right place at the right time. And to do that, you really need early engagement um, and community needs analysis, talking to communities to understand what their priorities are. And, you know, if I reflect on Durham, we've got some very deprived areas. We've got some affluent areas. So we really need to understand the difference of localities and really take an, you know, an outcome based approach to to our procurement and uh, contracting solutions. And I think probably the final thing to add for me from a practitioner's point of view in terms of getting the best out of the pound, every pound that we spend, we've trained and educated ourselves in the supply base for several years now um, in terms of how to engage with government, how to do business with government, how to bid and how to uh, win business. Obviously, the, the new reforms are very exciting. I think they're going to be really helpful, but we will have to go through quite an extensive training and education process, A, initially with ourselves and B, with the supply side. So that's me. Thank you. Darren, thank you very much for getting us off to such a good start. And also, you know, Faye Van Lee's local government practitioner view. Thank you so much. Yeah. Jeffrey. all good for you to um, carry on from here. I have you see you again. If I could ask you to unmute, Jeff. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Yours. And thank you for allowing uh, myself and Sipfoot to be part of this dialogue. Um, Procurement and value in particular are something that uh, we at SIPFA are very focused on in terms of um, continuously evaluating how public financial management can be better improved. And we think that value in it, all its dimensions is very important in um, enhancing performance. And as my colleague Isabel will talk about a bit later, um, there's the social aspect, but there's also many other aspects of value. And, and, and I think we need to, I think one of the things that we've learned coming out of the pandemic is that um, all of these pillars of value are very, very important in terms of ensuring resilience. Um, before, I think we've often focused on the financial aspects of resilience, and we have a financial resilience in indicator. And we are trying right now at SIPA to develop a more holistic approach to um, almost measuring uh, resilience with financial aspects being one of them. But we also recognize that social, cultural, environmental, operational resilience, these types of aspects are equally important. And I think that ties back to the whole concept of procurement, given just the um, significant sums of money that governments at both national and local levels uh, spend, uh, making sure that there is value in that procurement process. Um, but we also recognize, speaking with our colleagues across government, that um, there is a gap in sort of what people desire 
and the skills and competencies that exist that would allow um, uh, those people that are held responsible for the procurement process in terms of doing it in the most effective and efficient way. I had a couple of slides that I just wanted to share that I thought could sometimes visualization can speak um, a thousand words. And so I'm- Can we stream them for you, um, Jeff? Ah, uh, you will do that. Could you just pop them up, please? And while Jonathan is doing that, um, so we know that um, in, the, in the process of procurement, we have, um, we need to keep a constant attention to risk, risk both in terms of not just the process during regular times, but also when things go, um, when there's shocks to the system. And that's sort of what COVID um, introduced. I think one of the biggest lessons government learned was that, um, that to respond in an effective way, there needs to be robust uh, plans in place. And I think what we learned over the past 18 months was that those, those response plans were very uneven across the UK. Some authorities had, had these plans in place, others had them half-baked, others had plans, but for whatever reason, didn't actually follow the plan. And so we had, what we had in the end was um, very uneven performance in terms of how uh, supplies were procured. And I think that is something that we need to reflect on um, during the recovery phase. In this um, graphic that I show here, you will see that um, there's been an increasing number of countries that have developed procurement risk management strategies over the past few years, but that 43% of respondents still don't have any tools to assess public procurement risks. And so while averages are great, um, again, this is comparing country experiences, but the same applies for within a country. And more importantly, even within geographic regions. So neighboring councils or neighbor, neighboring authorities um, similarly reflect this very uneven performance of, of capacity. And I think that is something that we really need to um, consider. In the next slide, um, I have, it's kind of these spiral uh, diagrams, but I think what's important here is that about 40% of countries surveyed um, in 2020 had introduced competency models, uh, which define the critical skills necessary to accomplish a given procurement function. And this has increased quite significantly from a third in 2018. So progress is being made. Um, but again, there's variation because some countries define entry requirements um, to meet contracting authorities' needs. Um, there's also certification frameworks to enhance procurement professionalization. Um, and I think this is something that uh, institutes such as SIPFA are working very hard on to make sure that these types of qualifications um, gain traction and that they're being used consistently across, um, across geographies. Uh, and finally, um, on just on this slide, I would say that uh, localities and jurisdictions are increasingly recognizing public procurement as a standalone profession. Um, about 40% last year in this OECD uh, survey, which is being displayed in this graphic, compared to just a third uh, in 2018. And so again, there is this need to make sure that there is the capacity and qualification to actually procure for value. And when we say procure for value, exactly what does that mean? There needs to be some kind of framework in place so that the people that we ask to procure actually know what um, criteria is needed to get to the best outcomes. Um, in the next slide, this is just a project that we're working on um, with uh, a coalition um, across the UK. And um, it's something that is coming to fruition and that we're really excited about. Um, it's a coalition of academics, but it's also, uh, there's professional bodies such as us um, at SIPFA involved. 
And it aims to look at how procurement can be used as a tool to achieve outcomes. So basically looking to protect communities, to keep essential services running, supporting the local economy, economy and promoting um, um, environmental sustainability. And I've put a link here. And the reason I share this is because while we, talk, while we can talk a lot about what does better procurement look like, I think it's really important to tie it back to what the evidence show. And this um, collaborative project that we've undertaken and it scopes out to about 18 months or so, um, it will complete at the, in spring of next year. And it really is based on data, on interviews that we've conducted across the country, surveys. And I think it's really, really important to always map this conversation back to evidence. And this particular project is the largest and most comprehensive study of its type um, in local government during the health crisis that we've just um, faced. Um, on my next slide, um, this is just the final point I wanted to raise, and this is a value for money toolkit that SIPFA and the University of Oxford have just launched last month. Um, and so recently, there had been no strict guidelines around demonstrating the value for money, um, the outcome orientation of that aspect. And so we developed this tool it's intended to fill that gap, and we use the NAO's value for money um, definition um, framework, the four E's, economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. And we use that to kind of um, inform our understanding of what value for money can mean as it relates to specific projects. Um, if you go to this web link that I've shown here on this slide, uh, it includes the toolkit itself, which is free to use. Um, there's guidance notes, there's a case study that populates the spreadsheet to just to give you an idea of how you can use a toolkit like this. We also have some helpful instructional videos in terms of um, what the toolkit is and how you can go about using it. And it just helps to create, again, that, that framework for thinking um, and learning about the economic validity of public programs. And on my final slide, it's we have this um, peer learning group that we're launching at the same time as this toolkit. The first meeting is going to be on the 18th of November and it's co-hosted by Oxford and SIPFA. Um, you can learn more um, via the link at the bottom of the screen. And it's basically just to open a continual dialogue about ways we can improve value creation of public expenditure. And um, it's an ongoing theme, again, the first uh, quarterly meeting will be held this November. So if you're interested in carrying on the discussion that we're having today, uh, please contact us and please join the group because um, I think that's the best way to mobilize better understanding of not just procurement, but how value in procurement can be sustained. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And um, if you're happy, I'll, Jeffrey, I'll share all your slides with everyone who's registered today. This over Thank yours you. to Darren. So um, great pleasure next to introduce Chris White. Um, so much about grateful to you know, work on, on this agenda. Really grateful to get your views on where you know, where leveling up. Um, also a broad term, what, what does it mean? Is it been that clearly defined? But what, what this could mean in terms of procurement and social and economic benefits? Over to you, please, Chris. Sure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And that's exactly what I want to speak about in terms of how social value and the act is, is relevant, very relevant uh, to the levelling up agenda. Um, not least since uh, next year will be the 10th anniversary of, of the act, uh, when my uh, private members bill uh, first became legislation. Uh, and I, I do think, um, excuse me, I just something's come on my screen. Um, I do think that the principles that when we first framed the act are still very relevant today in terms of its innovation, its creativity uh, and its sort of ability in terms of the, the sector to inspire, inspire confidence. But what was seen as very light touch uh, legislation, because going back to to Darren's point and uh, sort of vis-a-vis -vis, uh, austerity, but this was this was really uh, put on the statute book in the in the sort of early days of the coalition um, government. So going right back to then, when you know uh, where things were seen as really tight, they were still seen as an opportunity to 
uh, view social value as being part of delivering uh, procurement. Um, what was a sort of light touch legislation from something uh, influencing something in the region, 25 billion of public spending in 2015, uh, now influences something like 100 uh, billion and now. I think it's fair to say that it's, it's sort of gone fits and starts. Um, it's gone through uh, reviews, the Lord Young review in 2015, uh, my own review uh, in 2017 with uh, Social Enterprise uh, UK, but it was when looking back at the, the Lord Young review, which despite the, the uh, act clearly uh, delivering in terms of public services and reducing, reducing costs, uh, his concerns were, and it's been mentioned by a couple of your speakers already, it's been mentioned in terms of, you know, the measurement is always going to be a challenge. Um, we also need to make sure there's greater understanding and greater awareness. But in terms of the measurement, I mean, there's, there is a lot of different uh, toolkits around. Uh, I would uh, caution people and say that this is about principles. And I think, you know, the famous phrase of not everything that counts can be measured and not everything that can be measured counts is something that we should always try and bear in mind. I think when things did start to change though, the, the sort of realization of what social value could could do was was the following the sort of tragic collapse of Carillion uh, and David Liddington very much understanding in his role as cabinet minister of what its potential could be. Um, but I think that is increasingly uh, relevant today. And I think na both no national uh, and local government is uh, becoming bolder in what they can see social value uh, being able to achieve, not least because I think people are starting to look more at the medium and long term rather than uh, immediate pressures. I think people are uh, much more strategic or having to be more strategic in their thinking. And I think this, this particular time when we are, uh, we are post Brexit, uh, we are hopefully moving away from the, uh, the pandemic the levelling up agenda is very much at the forefront. I think, as you pointed out, Jonathan, this is very much, you know, the public perception of however nebulous uh, levelling up is. It is seen as a very sort of popular in it, uh, by the public in, in its abstract. Um, I think uh, in terms of also the devolution agenda, the regionalisation agenda, and I do think very importantly are our local industrial strategies or however uh, they defi are defined will drive uh, this, this whole uh, sort of topic forward. St the strategic power of procurement is now being, being recognised much more. It seemed to be able to support communities, improve the environments and is part of uh, the government's very, very clear agenda for, you know, the whole uh, the economy working for everyone, delivering services and engaging with supply chains, which I think uh, have rarely seen such a mix before, whether that's through charities, whether that's through SMEs, uh, whether that's through a whole multitude uh, uh, of different business models. I mean, I personally, uh, we've talked about the Green Paper and I, I do welcome it, some of its themes, whether it's uh, opening up the supply base, whether that is the clear message that, and I think this is very important, that the public sector commercial teams do not have to select uh, the lowest bid. And I think that is a, you know, that paragraph is a fundamental change in, in how we think about procurement, how we think about commissioning and co-commissioning, co-design, co-creation, working much more uh, in favour of the SMEs than perhaps we have uh, done before. So that's my uh, start of 10. Um, I do welcome this debate. I'm, do, I'm very pleased that, uh, that the social value agenda is becoming uh, more visible. Um, it needs to become mainstream and I think, uh, and I'm very glad that your panel today are all working very hard to try and achieve that, that aim. So thank you for that. Many thanks indeed, Chris. Um, and our final speaker, we've been doing this project with Social Value UK. And it's a huge, huge pleasure to introduce 
Isabel Parasarum to they set out SVUK's um, views views on this and the, and the broader agenda before we move on to um, discuss amongst the panel. So over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here representing Social Value UK as its CEO, and I work alongside a fantastic co-leader who I must mention called Crispin Satikanye, who is not here with us today. And for those of you who haven't heard about Social Value UK, we are the professional body for social value and impact management. And our mission is to promote environmentalism, equality and well-being for everyone. And the way in which we hope to achieve this is by changing the way in which the world accounts for value. And so looking today at the government's leveling, leveling up agenda, I was looking at what exactly it is and the Conservative Manifesto of 2019 described it in a number of ways, but relevant today is the three concepts, the idea of investing in towns, cities, rural and coastal areas, uh, giving those areas control over how investment is made and levelling up skills. And there's a particular reference to apprenticeships and hopefully that will be something that I can speak on a bit further. When I looked also at the Institute of Fiscal Studies and its report on levelling up and its assessment of where and how, it talked about the fact that the UK is one of the most geographically unequal countries in the developed world and they were comparing us to 26 other countries and unfortunately we rank near the top of the league table and not in a good way. And they recognise that the government cannot be all things to all places. And they called for the Chancellor to ensure that there is a huge role for local government in levelling up. And obviously the task has been placed largely on the shoulders of local government. So I think that that has been achieved. But the importance of local involvement in decisions that are made locally cannot be overlooked. And one other thing that I would like to highlight in terms of the impact on regions that have would be considered as left behind is to take into account in our discussion the impact of the pandemic as well as the impact of Brexit and the fact that certain areas will be more impacted by those. In fact, it's probably viewed as a triple whammy in terms of being viewed as a left behind place, as well as the impact of Brexit and the pandemic. And today we're focusing particularly on procurement. And there are a few points that I hope will come out in the discussion. Um, I do want to highlight immediately the question that Brian has asked, which is all about SMEs and the support that they need in terms of procurement. And I know that um, Darren has already spoken a bit about the fantastic work that is being done in Durham to support those who wish to apply for contracts, etc. And that is one of the things that's been raised by some of our members who are very concerned about how they will be able to be put in a position to become one of the suppliers um, under the new agenda. But our call is broadly that each locality is addressed uniquely and that social value principles, as Chris has already said, it's about the principles for us, that those principles ought to apply not only to procurement, but to all stages, both before and after procurement is even a thing. And to ensure particularly that stakeholders are engaged in the planning process from the very beginning, and those stakeholders will largely be made up of local individuals and organisations, to ensure that current inequality is factored in to assessments of success. And when looking at outcomes, ensuring that outcomes are not only measured numerically, but also qualitatively. And that's where the concept of apprenticeships and the idea of big numbers when it comes to apprenticeships is something that we would really like to explore. Evaluation of outcomes needs to take place. It's not always apparent that that is happening or necessarily made particularly public. Um, and we want to ensure that not only we're looking at the way in which procurement is handled, but how actually are the promises that are being made when suppliers are tendering, et cetera, mm -hmm. for contracts? How are they enacted? What happens if they're not? 
And then finally, the idea that um, procurement engages a larger community of smaller suppliers. But this really flicks back to the point that Brian's made about the idea that the criteria that will apply to those suppliers takes account also of their unique setups because indeed they too are stakeholders and many of them will be local individuals and organizations and so we also need to think about the suppliers when assessing the success and the way in which we approach procurement at a local level so I will leave it there and I look forward to um, answering your questions and also responding to some of the things that have already been said. Isabel, huge thanks you know, for rounding up our line of experts. And thanks to, you know, to Chris, Jeffrey and Dan for really you know, setting the scene, each with unique perspectives um, to give to us. So look, we're into the dialogue, the exchange session. Uh, we've, we've got the Q&A box. Brian's put one very good question and I'll quickly ask the panel if they'd like to respond to that. Throw your questions into the Q&A box. For those on twi Twitter, here's our hashtag for one final time. Um, but though, um, who, who wants to take on to Brian's question about SMEs? Um, how do we make it a level playing field um, in providing services to the wider public sector through hurdles? I say this, that in the car, this we do quite a lot of work with local authorities and to the, uh, in terms of economic plans, it's always the same thing. I never knew that 99.99% of our, our uh, the businesses in our area are SMEs. Well, they're, they're, they're crucial to uh, our, our national economy, especially post-recovery. Any, anyone would like to take up that question? How do we get SMEs um, totally immersed in this? I don't mind giving it a go. Um, no. I think there needs to be a more level playing field. And I think... The question is, what, the, what do we exactly mean by a level playing field? Because uh, there are going to be, at the end of the day, cost differences. Small, uh, smaller businesses face higher costs. They don't have the economies of scale. Uh, they don't have the economies of scope of offering different types of products and services. And as a result, in terms of uh, competing with larger, organ larger businesses, there needs to be some type of offset, I think, in the procurement process where you, again, when coming back to this concept of value, what does value mean? Is it just looking at it from a pure monetary perspective of the lowest cost um, wins, the, wins the tender? Or do we assign some type of value uh, to the fact that we are uh, helping smaller businesses, that we're helping businesses that are more locally um, domiciled that, you know, certain types of uh, goods and services are provided by organizations that help in the training process. We talked about apprenticeships. Um, all of these things are great to talk about, but unless we're able to assign some type of value to those aspects and then embed that in the final calculation, I think at the end of the day, we will then otherwise just come up with chasing the lowest cost provider. And then part of that process, unfortunately, is almost throwing the baby out with the bathwater in the sense that it's really hard to compete even in other areas such as professionalism <laughs> because people are just really, really competing just on price. And so whatever sector you're in, in terms of talking about procurement, we have to um, make sure that the framework for procurement assigns values to these other attributes that are just not cost related. And I think that's, that really, really requires a fundamental shift in the way we think, not just in terms of procurement, but also in terms of how um, grants from government are, 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 are rolled out to, the, to local governments. Right now it's highly fragmented. And so how can we make that fragmented um, short-termism uh, perspective? How can we correct it so that it's, you know, um, a bit, um, it addresses some of the requirements that we have today. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Chris, you put your hands up. Over to you, yeah. please. Sure, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, uh, a lot of which uh, I agree with what you say. I, uh, but I do think, I mean, th I think the lessons uh, from Carillion have to be learned that there are, you know, a huge number of suppliers out there. And I think if we do uh, ignore our SMEs and their 
capacity and their expertise, we we will miss be missing a trick. I think it's a sort of both parties need to do things differently, though. I don't think um, I think our, our SMEs, our suppliers need to be more confident. They need to be able to think that there is an opportunity to to win a tender. I think that's that's an important part, an important step. And I think the the, the green paper puts some uh, frameworks out there as how this could be achieved. But I also think there's a huge responsibility on our commissioners, whether at a, a local or, or a national level, to better understand the marketplace, to better understand what SMEs have to offer. Uh, the advantages of working with SMEs, the agility, the creativity, uh, the speed of response and how uh, they can probably better in many occasions uh, be able to deal and deliver public services as would something like a Carillion or a G4S, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it is about raising this awareness. It is about explaining to our SMEs that there are, is a different, you know, there's a different whatever in town, different sheriff in town. And I think post-Brexit, if there are any advantages post-Brexit, uh, a, a sort of more domestic procurement policy will be a great help. Many thanks, Chris. Hands up, I see Darren, followed by Isabel. Yeah, this is, a, this is a real tricky issue, but I think for me, the, the most important thing is supplier engagement mm. as early as possible. Um, you know, and again, one of the good things coming out of the national procurement policy statement that will be, you know, enshrined in legislation is that is the need for public bodies to publish pipelines and be more transparent about what procurement opportunities are, are going on in in the future. And I do think, you know, uh, in terms of quid pro quo, I think the government have an obligation to give public bodies longer visibility of of of, of budgets and spending to to facilitate that. But what that then means is that we as practitioners need to talk to the market, understand what's out there and who's out there, but also get the suppliers bid ready so that they are able to compete um, as effectively um, as, as possible. That takes time, that takes resource, it takes training, it takes education. Um, we've done a lot of that in the Northeast and particularly in Durham. And I'm, you know, just statistically 68% of our spend in Durham of our 600 million is with SMEs and the third sector. So, you know, that, 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 those hard yards have been put in and, and we're starting to see the, the benefits of that. But obviously with new procurement reform, we're going to have to repeat a lot of that again because there'll be new ways of working. So we're going to have to um, work hard. But I think another lesson for me is, you know, and Chris touched on it in, in terms of Carillion, we're going to need to be more aware of what's going on, not just at tier one, but what's going on at tier two and tier three and tier four to understand what's going on in supply chains. Because there's big opportunities there, but there's also risks, you know, and, and if you'd have said to me two or three years ago, you know, that I'd have lost sleep over face masks uh, in terms of PPE for frontline services, I thought you were from another, another planet. But again, if you actually look at what's gone on there, procurement practitioners such as I have outsourced, offshored, and created a huge dependency, um, not only on one country, but on one town, it seemed. Um, so again, there's some real big lessons there to learn about supply chain resilience, supply chain diversity. Um, and I think, I genuinely believe there will be a lot more inshoring going on in the next few years from procurement practitioners that in itself will create an opportunity for existing SMEs but also for new organisations to form. Many thanks Darren. Isabel please over to you. Lovely thank you very much. Um, it's been really interesting listening um, to the way in which um, Pragmatically, Darren, your, you and your team are assisting in this. Um, absolutely fascinating. But I was really taken by what Joy had to say in the chat because it reflects a discussion that I had with one of our members, one of the first discussions that I had because this person representing an organisation was so passionate about this issue. And Joy talks about the idea that 
the procurement structure wasn't compatible with the way in which these organizations that she refers to, small community organizations, were structured. And then she talks about um, the idea that we're not just thinking here about SMEs, but social enterprises too. And um, one of the things that we at Social Value UK do in terms of addressing this issue is um, advocacy on behalf of our members. So one of the things that we're currently setting up, if anybody's interested, is a working group that will um, work together to inform us of the issues in terms of procurement for suppliers, especially suppliers that are perhaps smaller or from civil society organisations or whatever. Um, and to be able to represent their views so that we can feed into changes that we believe need to be made. So that's one way in which we are trying to address this issue. But on a practical level, um, what the feedback that we get is that small organisations are not necessarily aware of the opportunities that are coming up in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And awareness is a huge thing, how to effectively get the message across that this is happening. Um, that is a, a, an enormous problem. But the other thing that somebody in the chat who describes themselves as for the region CIC um, talked about was belief, needing SMEs needing to believe that they have a real opportunity to win contracts. Otherwise, it's seen as a waste of their time. So even if we flag that these potential opportunities are available, would a smaller organisation think actually it's worth our while to go ahead? And I've, ha I've had many discussions like this, um, even within our own organisation as to whether, for example, we go for grant funding and that's a parallel. Um, and often when, when we are awarding contracts or, or local government is awarding contracts, if the organisations that are winning those bids are always or often larger organisations, if you're a savvy SME, you're going to look at that and think, actually, I can assess that this is not going to be a good use of our time unless somebody persuades you otherwise. So that's that's another key factor. And then finally, um, how to avail themselves of that opportunity um, in terms of training, as Darren said, education, etc. But literally walking smaller organisations through how to win a bid, how to apply, what the process is, what the timeline is, how much resource will be needed, what will happen if they don't win the bid, you know, all of those kind of things is absolutely key. So I hope that that's helpful. Many thanks indeed, um, Isabel. Um, now, you, you raised a very good point, Isabel, about that, that kind of triple, triple blow, Brexit, Covid, and being left behind areas. Now, uh, for, for my life, I, yesterday I, I put my suit and kind of proper shoes on yesterday to, to return to the Palace of Westminster for an event. It's been been a long time. And this event was the, 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 the launch of an all-party parliamentary group for SEEK, South East England Councils. Um, you know, that everyone wants, you know, everyone wants, must have a dog in the levelling up fight, whether it's been different parts of London as well as the the areas of the north which and the coastal areas which are seen most needing now clearly a part of leveling up is if it's to mean anything it's rebalancing providing greater economic opportunities across the country and they clearly you know, from, from their perspective they, they had an MP for Hastings and Rye talking about the huge deprivation there but on, on the general on the general of the things how can we make sure these reforms um, are, are able to deliver into the into kind of generally le generally left behind areas beyond the confines of um more, more, more prosperous areas and how can we use um in, in concrete terms of the use of procurement spend and procurement choice to ensure that kind of economic outcomes whether it's be um you know, apprenticeships that you know, will help us get through the next zero age and all the rest of it are generally providing a, a sort of long-term economic uplift for, for areas that need them. Is, is there, is there, what do you see as the new opportunities? I think we discussed, discussed this, Chris, if you know, the, the water torture of the Brexit years is to mean anything, we need to get something um, delivered you know, to people which they can see experience in their daily lives, jobs and local economies being a, being a very visible, immediate, tangible 
thing. What, 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 what do we think amongst the panel are the opportunities for economic uplift and what are the best levers for achieving them? Darren, you've got your hands up, unless you didn't take it down from last time. No, no, it's a new hand. It's a new hand. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I think first and foremost, um, a sustainable funding stream from government is essential. Um, you know, there's, there's talk about levelling up. If that's one-off bits of capital that arrive at this point in time that don't come again, whilst that's very welcomed, um, it isn't going to address the issue. So we need sustainable funding over a longer period of time to give us time to plan the procurements really more effectively. Um, also, that planning then with the supplier engagement means you can better understand the community. So, for example, you know, if I look at County Durham specifically, the city is a very affluent area, but some of the um, towns and villages on the east are less so. So if we wanted to create opportunities in the, some of the deprived areas, we need to be quite clever tactically and technically on to do that. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, since the Social Value Act came in in 2017, we, uh, we launched the tool called Themes, Outcomes and Measures. Chris was there at the, um, you know, at the launch. And what that does now enable us to objectively measure social value, put values on it, and we could even prioritise. So jobs in one area could be worth more than jobs in another area. So there's tools and techniques um, out there. But I think the important lesson I've probably learned the last two years or so is as, you know, as good as that tool is and that other brands are available, of, of, of course, the important thing is, is making sure it's the right social value at the right place at the right time. And it's not just social value um, for the sake of it, because every community is different. It has its own needs. And really that's where the, the tactical skill comes in from a practitioner's point of view. But fortunately now with, you know, organisations like Social Value UK, Social Value Portal, there's a lot of tools, techniques, knowledge and skill that is available for people to learn and apply. Many thanks, Sam. Great response. Isabel, hands up. Over to you, please. Thanks. I just wanted to focus on um, the idea of what Darren has actually just raised in terms of the idea that we can't have one approach that fits all so even at a concept level where we're saying more jobs you know this is really important that we have more jobs more apprentices actually my question would be I would love to challenge you not you personally Darren but but generally what is it that we are valuing here so focusing particularly on apprenticeships if we say that the goal with any particular procurement processes that you know one of the ticks on the chart would be that there are more apprenticeships is that actually something of value to that particular locality so if we offer more apprenticeships as a result or apprenticeships are created does that take away the role of somebody else who might be more highly paid would an organisation simply replace somebody who's more highly skilled and more, more highly paid with two apprentices and they, thereby they obtain cheap labour? With the apprenticeships, what happens once the apprenticeship is over? Does the person then go on to do more training, gain more skills, perhaps retain their place within that workforce? Um, where do they end up after they've completed that apprenticeship? And what, what exactly does a person gain from the particular apprenticeship? So all of us can probably relate to the idea that some apprentices may be given a role where they are making cups of tea and going out and getting the sandwiches for everybody at lunch. But are they actually gaining any skills that are going to benefit themselves and the organisation and the community long term versus a good quality apprenticeship? where the person has a, an induction program, they've got training in place, they've got a future planned, what happens after that first six months, and also are they being topped up by being given at least the living wage in order to um, sustain themselves for those six months. So when I talked initially about quality versus quantity, and maybe it doesn't have to be one or other, maybe it's not a binary choice, maybe it's both, what I would plead for is that we think about not only the locality, but also in that thought, 
what is it that that locality needs? And rather than focusing purely on numbers, that we look at how we're delivering those numbers and what those numbers are going to actually achieve within that community. Many thanks, Isabel, for a great reply. Jeffrey, you've got your hand up, so. Yeah, I just you. wanted to follow up on a, um, one point that Isabel made and one point Darren made. Um, on Isabel's point about apprenticeships, I really think that um, we do need to reflect on the quality very much because in speaking with a lot of businesses, um, what we often hear is that um, they just don't value the kind of skills and uh, backgrounds that the apprentices that are currently coming out of the system actually have. So we really need to reflect on um, beyond just the technical skills that some of these um, apprentices are coming out with, and not just apprentices, but uh, just also um, early career um, job seekers, do they have sort of the soft skills um, to kind of, you know, work in teams and to um, be able to communicate effectively with other people? I think those can be often overlooked. Um, and secondly, the point of incentives that further education and training colleges have in terms of pumping out um, certain types of qualifications or certifications. I think the framework in terms of how these institutions are, are, are paid and, and, and rewarded uh, needs to change if we want to see a change in the types of uh, job entrants that come out from that process. In response to Darren's point on um, you know, moving away from short-termism, I, I fully agree with that. And I would just add that we also need to make sure that there's less um, ring fencing of existing pots of money. And there's just, just a plethora of small little pots. And for small um, councils in particular, it's really, really time consuming and they don't have the capacity or resources to be chasing you know, just these tiny little sums of money. And that by itself puts them in a disadvantage of getting money. And um, if everything is ring fenced, for some communities, um, their needs are very different from say a neighboring council. And so if you ring fence everything, it doesn't give them the agility or flexibility that we're saying is so important in terms of reaching some of these value aspirations. So that would just be a couple of points that I would add. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Now we have a reputation to uphold as the always on time think tank. So I'm gonna invite Chris White to now give your final reflections on this and maybe anything else before we wrap up for today. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jonathan. And just going back to Isabel one last time, I think, you know, in terms of what Deming used to say when I was doing my uh, MBA and talking about it is important to measure things, but as soon as you start setting targets, that can influence uh, the wrong behaviours. Like, you know, just the number of things is not always uh, the answer. In terms of levelling up, which is what this, uh, this session has been about, the proof of the pudding will be in, in, I think, two or three years' time when manifestos and elections happen and governments will be very much measured on whether this agenda has worked. And I think uh, people like uh, Malcolm Harbour, I see who's been uh, on the sort of uh, the chat box, I think the answer to most of these problems are or is local industrial strategies. Although these things are incredibly complex to set up to get the stakeholders working together. But I think the outcome, if the work is put in into making these making these happen, create them. Uh, and I think the long-term gains are quite fantastic. Many thanks indeed, Chris. And thanks for a um, hurrah for local industrial strategy. Long live Liz. Um, so look, folks, um, we've come to the end, not just of today's session, but our sequence of webinars. Um, thank you for everyone who's participated. Thank you especially to Social Value UK for your constant support with these. Huge round of applause, virtual real time for Darren, Jeffrey, Isabel and Chris, really giving such insight into, into, into our deliberations. Um, we will share a copy of the slide decks. Isabel, if you're happy, share your, your, your social value principles to all delegates who attended today. 
It only leaves me to thank you once more, time and thank you for everyone who registered, took part, threw in questions, joined in the chat. And the final word from the Carnes is, we'll be writing this all up, hopefully with a publication date of early to mid-November for our True Value report. So, without any further ado, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much and hope to see you again very soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.